Okay, um, a very warm welcome from my side. I think we are good to go. I just received the, um, um, the green light uh, to start this session. A very well, warm welcome um, to uh, this um, Sunday walk through ideas of um, planetary aid and decolonizing aid. Um, first things first. Um, there is a simultaneous interpretation. You can choose your preferred language by uh, clicking on the globe symbol um, on your screen. Um, there should be now um, um, simultaneously um, um, signs from uh, the Bahasa Indonesia team and uh, one um, interpreting the German uh, version of it. Um, so as we have cleared this, uh, my name is Andrea Steinke. I work as a research fellow at the Center for Humanitarian Action in Berlin. I am an anthropologist by training, which is maybe also interesting when it comes to uh, talking about decolonizing um, and colonial legacies um, in the sector, but also in, in this specific discipline. Um, I did uh, research on faith-based humanitarian interventions in Haiti, uh, first of all, but also uh, have worked on other topics such as South-South cooperation. Um, now I work on the humanitarian development and peace nexus, and lately also on the climate crisis and uh, the so-called climate humanitarianism. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to this um, spe uh, specific uh, session. It's a pleasure um, to be on stage with Tamam. And um, this is the third session um, of um, a whole series of, of, of dialogues that are taking place um, uh, organized by um, Medico and its partners. The first session, the master's house addressed the structures and architectures of the aid system and its, tangum, and its entanglements with uh, neoliberal models of development and it kind of laid the groundwork um, to the next sessions to come. All of those sessions are recorded and will be uploaded. Um, this uh, is an FYI to everyone here with us today, but also, um, uh, to make um, clear that you can also revisit um, the earlier sessions of, um, of the series. The second session then, this is like the one that came before us, is um, called uh, the Master's Gardens and discussed um, topics such as extractivism, colonialism and green capitalism. Um, the links should be um, to those sessions should be posted in the chat at some point. Um, now we can kind of go um, to our very own session. Um, today's session is it's called the Master's Goodwill, New Strands of Humanitarian Aid. Um, I just give uh, like two or three minutes uh, brief input and then we can get started um, with the mom. Um, so more or less some days, I feel it seems like the humanitarian house is on fire, both um, literally, literally and figuratively. And um, often we read that um, the sector or certain organizations within the sector are rocked by so-called scandals over abuse of power and misconduct. Groups have formed within the humanitarian sectors um, um, that aim at uh, decolonizing them, most notably um, decolonize MSF, uh, which is maybe something that Hamam uh, can or want to speak about later, where both uh, individual behavior and structural deficits are addressed. Um, then there are questions of the indirect complicity of the whole humanitarian system with both power structures that are actually responsible for creating um, many of the humanitarian crises that they are then come to, to um, um, tend to. Um, at the same time, humanitarianism and humanitarian aid is challenged by um, the looming climate crisis with the frequency and the intensity of disasters and subsequent humanitarian need kind of spiraling out of control. Um, all in all, it bears asking what is the vision that we are actually are thriving forwards to and uh, how does a decolonized sector then look like? Well, actually, is what does decolonizing and decoloniality means to us? Is it a narrative, a frame of reference, a state of mind, a pol political position, an identity, a practice or a doing? And many of those things maybe. When I'm preparing the sessions, I was actually reminded of uh, the time in the beginning of writing my PhD more than a decade ago by now, um, a colleague of mine, a lecturer at the Institute um, for Latin, Latin American Studies, um, 
who was actually among the persons who has introduced me um, to Latin American thinkers such as Enrique Dussel and Anne Balkirano and their positions on decoloniality. So I came to her and um, with the idea of writing one of my chapters um, on decoloniality or from a decolonial decolonial perspective. And um, I remember distinctly how she uh, very kindly explained to me that uh, decoloniality is not something that one can turn off and on for certain chapters of writing. So um, this kind of was for me a very enlightening moment. And it's maybe also something that uh, helps um, us to think about ways to act and um, turn things into practice rather than um, circling around narratives. Um, having said that, um, I would like um, to introduce Tamam now and give him the space to uh, present his ideas. Tamam Aludab is a medical doctor and a humanitarian. He has worked with uh, several NGOs on human humanitarian policy research institutions. Currently, he is the president of uh, MSN Netherlands and a PhD student at the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute. Um, he has been very much involved in the decolonizing discussion and narrative and practice. And uh, for full disclosure, Tamam and me have been having bilateral discussions on this very topic, uh, um, yeah, intensely during the past two or three years. So um, maybe one more, um, one more uh, a hint before I give you the stage, Tamam, um, to everyone, uh, maybe to the format of this session. Um, this is a fish, this is supposed to be a fishbowl um, discussion, so that means that there is a space for everyone in this panel. Um, Tamam is going to give the input, the, the starting input, more or less 20 25 minutes. And um, after that, if you would like to uh, contribute your thought with a comment, a question, or um, another format of your choice, you can click on the hand symbol that you find below um, in this um, in this uh, Zoom setup. Um, you will then be asked by our off-scene moderator, it will not be me, it will be someone who is not on, on screen, um, if you would like uh, to join per camera or, per vo or only per voice. Um, and then you will be uh, given the time um, um, to speak and to join us in this in, in this discussion. So we actually do not want it uh, uh, in this kind of lecture uh, or panel format, but in as, uh, as participative as, as, as possible um, format. And um, I would like uh, to remind everyone, including myself, uh, not to speak too fast um, because um, as I've said in the beginning, uh, everything is uh, translated. So it uh, is, uh, we have a level of um, accessibility that includes uh, the majority of people. So um, yes, please enjoy the mom's input. Thank, thank you very much, Andrea, for the introduction. And thank you everybody for having me here today. Uh, it's such a pleasure and I'm, uh, um, I just want to start with the caveats first. I think it's important. Uh, the first caveat is obviously there's the tension between working in the humanitarian sector in an organization uh, like MSF and at the same time speaking outside the um, mainstream uh, humanitarian discourse. Uh, so my caveat here is that yes, I am being introduced and obviously it's very difficult to cut oneself into parts. I do I do occupy the elected position as the president of MSF uh, Netherlands, but today I'm talking on my own behalf, not on behalf of the organization. And the second one is um, a more personal caveat. Um, to uh, uh, avoid any sanctification at any point, I have had a, a 22 years career in the humanitarian sector by now. And of those, most of them have been in the persona of a very loyal company man that hasn't seen most of the problems that we are talking about. Now, I've worked about 10 years for the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Federation and the rest of it for uh, MSF. So uh, I say that from a, what I say today, I say from a position of atonement rather than uh, from one of, uh, of virtue. Um, Let's start with the conclusions, at least in general, of the previous sessions. 
what is obvious is that we're not going to talk today again about what has what is problematic with humanitarian aid. There has been uh, multiple explorations of our collective history, of our uh, entanglements with both colonial and neoliberal uh, politics, uh, of our position as a, a moderator or uh, uh, a moderating force in making um, an exploitative world order uh, more palatable for people who are suffering its uh, most uh, severe consequences. All that is probably obvious to all people, although we have variations in that understanding. But if we start that, uh, if we take that as our starting point, we immediately confront uh, two issues. Um, the first issue is, so what do we do? Do we dismantle this uh, you know, system that is an accessory to a wider system of, of patriarchal capitalist and, uh, and neo-colonial uh, hegemony, or do we not? And that in itself is a problematic issue. Obviously, this is not a new question because uh, uh, Rosa Luxemburg asked it 124 years ago, I think in 1899 in Reform and Revolution. And uh, um, if I remember it right, she, she uh, called it the, the uh, spirit of uh, compromise or something like this, uh, when people like Bornstein talked about reforming the party. What she tried to say is reform is a futile event. And the only way to go is that let capitalism um, uh, break as much as it can so revolution that turns the tide is, is possible. Um, she was cover, get comfortable in that position, and I, many of the of the people who called for revolution were comfortable with the breaking down the system. We have a struggle here. Uh, the struggle is, uh, despite the down the, the shortcomings of the system, we are uh, uh, not in a position, I believe, either physically or morally, of um, you know pressing the red, you know the red. Uh, detonation, you know, the figurative red detonation button that that, that uh, eliminates the humanitarian system. And that's simply because uh, there are tens of millions of people who imperfectly but consistently receive aid uh, uh, in, in multiple forms. Uh, problematic, um, inefficient, inconsidered, and so on in many cases. But I look at our own output in MSF, and we do work in, in some of the hardest hit places. And an, an annual uh, uh, work of nearly 12 million patients consistently on year. Um, the struggle here I have personally is that we aren't in a position to say, okay, it's fine if they don't receive that aid next year, or those who are under treatment today uh, wouldn't, uh, the important part is to uh, change the system. I think there's a, uh, <laughs> at least a moral ambiguity in, in this position, which takes us back. It's, we are talking about a colonial system that does harm, and this is familiar, but uh, there, are, um, there can be found, uh, positive externalities or dependencies. How do we go about that? The answer, the optimistic and often unrealistic um, answer is let's reform the system. And those of you who have been engaged in the humanitarian system long enough will, will know about the reform efforts, uh, including the 2015 uh, Grand Bargain, 2015-16, which talked about localization, is talked about uh, 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 dissolving power. We're eight years later, and uh, we're hearing uh, talks about a grander yet bargain that overcomes the problems of, uh, of the grand bargain, namely that it hasn't happened. Namely that even a, a, a dissolution of power doesn't happen to people who are affected by emergencies. It doesn't happen to, uh, doesn't deliver agency or uh, decision-making to people who need aid. Uh, it delivers it, out of the hands of the Western bourgeoisie who control the, human, the transnational humanitarian system into the hands of the local bourgeoisie who aren't um, necessarily um, 
fully concerned with the with the uh, problems of their uh, constituency that they are helping. Um, the localization agenda in you will hear multiple opinions. Is it better than the previous one? In theory, it is. Uh, is it one that has worked? I doubt that many people will argue that. So what other reforms do we have? There has been a talk for a while uh, about uh, um, accountability to beneficiaries. Now, let alone that beneficiaries is a, is a horrible word in itself, uh, but accountability to beneficiaries is one of those brilliant sounding um, clickbait expressions in humanitarianism that uh, uh, sounds great on reports and proposals and, and, and is for all effects and purposes and unimplementable. There was more about good donorship that has uh, gone to hell with, the, with the, a, a, um, a newer generation of people who are responsible for aid. Priti Patel in the UK who uh, governed the uh, UK aid for a while and linked it to uh, uh, to uh, trade deals and so on is but one figure of money. You will know about Denmark and um, and uh, the uh, continuous attempts at, the, at deporting refugees, even legitimate, fully qualified refugees. That's not even asylum seekers, which is wrong. But found, uh, but that the the xenophobic right has found a an argument uh, uh, for it, even if it doesn't hold water. The problem with the reform that is initiated by people in power is that it it aims to sustain the power before it aims to sustain uh, uh, the goals of the reform. So, then, am I creating a possible um, contradiction that is unsolvable? We cannot overthrow the system or shouldn't or should be extremely considerate about it. And we cannot reform it because it is made in a way that is unreformable. But to reform it is to change it fundamentally from what it is. I would put that aside for a few minutes, if I may, because I want to talk about a little bit about what is it that we're trying to address. And in talking about um, decolonizing aid, we have fallen into a potential um, difficulty, which is um, decolonizing is a very uh, attractive proposition. There is a clear uh, antagonist. There is a clear, uh, uh, at least a mental image of an outcome that uh, where, where a, an uh, unequal and oppressive relationship uh, is, is removed. The moment you start operationalizing that expression, start facing several difficulties. One of them was expressed by Takan Young in 2012 uh, in, an, in an essay that is now more famous called uh, Decolonizing is Not a Metaphor. Um, and uh, the argument they made, both of them are uh, native, uh, uh, native people from North America and uh, uh, or as we should call it, Turtle Island. Um, the problem they've had is applying the expression of decolonizing on anything that expresses, that shows an oppressive relationship, um, demeans or undermines the expression itself. Because for them, as, as uh, 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 people who have been disenfranchised, removed from their lands and, and, uh, and their culture, Decolonizing can mean only one thing, which is the repatriation of land and people. And I understand that fully, uh, uh, but I would roughly argue that this is uh, uh, only one, one of two possible arguments. This comes from the continuing um, uh, settler colonial perspective, the people who are living under settler colonial perspectives. And uh, those are a very clear uh, uh, context that still go on until now those are uh, Canada, the United States, New Zealand, and uh, Australia, as well as Israel's occupation of Palestine. The in in people who are still living under settler colonialism, the uh, removal of of uh, uh, the the colonial entity and re the repatriation of people to their land and their rights is, is the singular meaning of of decolonizing. 
However, for many other uh, contexts, societies, communities, and countries that have been um, decolonized from the military or, or the direct uh, uh, domination of their previous colonizers, um, the continuation of coloniality is one that has carried many descriptions from uh, uh, over the years. The neocolonialism or the coloniality, as, as uh, Andrea described in the in the South American literature, um, neocolonialism by um, God, I forgot the name of the ex-president. Anyhow. Uh, is the continuation of the power relationships that are imposed on ex-colonies. And this is evident everywhere. Today, we have still have a Security Council that decides that is the uh, ex-winners in a war. Uh, most of them are colonial powers. We have a continuation even within uh, uh, multilateral organizations. The donors are still ex-colonial countries and they still want to exert domination over their uh, ex-colonies through aid. Um, so we are talking about all that and that affects us as aid organizations. We receive aid money from donors or in the case of MSF, for example, from private citizens. All of them and all of us are uh, largely positioned in, in, in the humanitarian system. In, in, a, um, in the global north, we are affected um, epistemically and culturally by the values that are deemed appropriate and right in that global north. And um, we have an incredibly uh, tense concentration of humanitarian aid agencies in four or five countries, the United States, and that's effectively in, two, in New York and, and Washington DC, and in three or four capitals in Europe. That leads to a uh, homogeneity of, of how the world is seen. And, uh, um, and that homogeneity is what produced uh, uh, also the, the supremacy of, of an imperfect system like liberal democracy, uh, a homogeneity of, of what human rights as a singularly individual thing that disregards communities or societies or habits or cultures, all of that is a, is, is a production of the same thing, and it goes to humanitarian aid. So today we have humanitarian aid that accepts a, a few premises. One of them is that there are people who are entitled, who have a humanitarian prerogative and have the right to uh, act, act on it. Humanitarianism in its purest Dionantus Red Cross and MSF and others form is our right to provide aid, not people's right to receive it. It implies that we have the right to decide on behalf of people what aid and to what extent should they receive. And if we extend it further, our singular purpose, despite slogans, is to save lives. Uh, uh, Bornstein and Redfield described it as the biological imperative to only save lives. Uh, and that ends up translating into our everyday practicalities. The very well meaning, very honest, practicality for, of implementing humanitarian aid. People sitting, removed from people they are helping, often um, without the physical, geographical, or, or mental, cultural, or epistemic capability of, of empathy with the people they are helping, and who make decisions. Today, we will do, we have scarce resources. We will put them in this conflict, not in that. In this outbreak, not in that. We will provide vaccines, but not treatment. We will give mosquito nets, but not uh, Artemis uh, therapy. Uh, we will treat mothers and children, but not men. The problem in that is, on the one hand, the loss of agency of people who face confront disasters. They are not only losing their health and potentially their life, they are on top of that losing um, their, their ability to make decisions about their lives in what is potentially a severely dehumanizing process. The second thing is um, going from there. We have given ourselves an, a right to um, decide who lives, that's aid. But by deciding who lives with scarce resources, we're also deciding who dies. This is the, uh, what Ashim Bembe described in, in a post 9-11, context as necropolitics. It's not a positive right. It is one that talks about people removed outside uh, um, uh, deciding who dies. We 
effectively are capable of uh, depriving a whole populations of potential healthcare or shelter or food. Um, as if that's not problematic enough, we draw standards that are based on, on a narrow field. So for example, in medicine, uh, biomedical standards uh, that assume that uh, Western hospitals are the pinnacle of, uh, of human uh, achievement in healing and health are stripped down to fit the budgets and planted in places that do not have the infrastructures to support it. And in the process, all local knowledge about healing, about, uh, 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 about one's own health, how to seek it and how to prioritize it vanishes with those changes. However, we are in a position where we have some tools and some ability to use them. So if we accept that us being the, the uh, decider of who lives and who dies is fundamentally wrong, and if we accept that a depoliticized or seemingly depoliticized neutral uh, humanitarianism is politicized by its uh, by, by, by the, the virtue of it accepting the political system as it is and not challenging it, what can we do? One of the things we start with is that we are within the exact system. We are now uh, saving people's lives and sending them away only to go back to the same precarity that they are living in. They are going back to die in the same conflicts, in the same epidemics, in the same um, violent situations. And here I would propose a, an argument on, on livability. We have no the, the differentiation between humanitarianism and development is that um, development is concerned with, uh, with uh, poverty reduction in the future. It's a, a future goal. And I would argue that there's a step missing in the middle. If, and, and I'll use it in medical terms. We have um, in the past few years started treating diabetes in children, for example, which we used to not see very often because people died before they reached the clinic. We save them from a, 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 an acute episode of, of ketoacidosis, which is one of the side effects of diabetes. And then we send them home. There's no fridges, there's no possibility of treatment. There's, we have a responsibility um, to, to treat people and to ensure that the treatment is sustainable. I'll finish on a note. Um, one of the things that we are talking about is decolonizing aid, which is a proposition that uh, aid has problems. And if we remove the problems, there will be aid remaining that uh, can function. I think this is too ambitious because the humanitarianism is not only afflicted by um, uh, uh, colonial attitudes or capitalist or pat uh, patriarchal and, and paternalistic ones. It is built on those. And I will, my proposition is we talk in addition to decolonizing about an emancipatory humanitarianism about a form of humanitarianism that is based on solidarity and common good rather than on charity, um, doesn't take uh, uh, the status quo, the political or, or, or social or economic status quo as its starting point, but creates that uh, and, and creates a legitimate one that provides agency to people it supports. Um, it subordinates the technical solutions uh, to the emancipatory choices that people make on behalf of themselves and uh, and does not accept the handing down the charitable dissolution of power as something that we should wait for people uh, for, for the dominant classes in our discipline to do out of the goodness of their hearts there is a a misuse in at least well I, i'm and not yet reconciled use of Fanon, Franz Fanon, uh, particularly in his Wretched of the Earth, in talking about decolonizing. Fanon talked about a moment of departure of colonialism. And that's the armies, mainly in Algeria, the French armies. He talked also about the legitimacy of violence. I don't think that metaphor applies here. However, the desire to provide agency to people so they can make decisions about their lives, and whereby we as humanitarians are subordinated to those decisions rather than, uh, th th rather than ones with the power to make them, is not impossible to imagine. And I think that might be um, a reform that goes beyond 
uh, the, the, the meager limitations of, of the current discussion on reforms. I will stop here and uh, uh, stop babbling and hear questions and, and discussions. Thank you very much um, for the opportunity. Thank you, Tamam, for um, kicking us off with those inspiring ideas and thoughts. Um, I'm very much looking forward to hearing um, people's reactions or people's um, ideas or, or um, thinking of uh, going forward. Um, if you have such a um, idea or want to raise a question or want to join us in this format, please uh, raise your hand and uh, you will be forwarded uh, uh, into our fishbowl. Please really don't hesitate because as um, um, I've said earlier, it's really um, part of the solution to be discussing it um, in, an, in, a, in a collective way rather than in this you know the expert is giving you the advice and then we all sit and say aha okay um this is what we have to do so um please uh feel very welcome um to join us here in this uh, round of discussion um while you take the um while you assemble your ideas and take the courage to do so um i would like to take the opportunity to um maybe take Tamam a little bit by his words and um, um, ask for um, some practical ideas. You know, um, I uh, work in an institution that works uh, kind of close with a lot of humanitarian organizations. I uh, have a re uh, frequent contact to policy advisors within organizations. You yourself are now back in this, um, in this position. And um, I'm wondering how um, those ideas of an emancipatory um, um, idea um, if I understood you right, as opposed to this um, structural breakdown uh, that uh, the, uh, the decolonization might entail, so this uh, emancipatory humanitarian aid would be a little bit more like a step-by-step -step, um, 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 way to engage also individuals um, in, this, in, in, in this reform. Um, what are some practical ideas of how to actually um, engage in this form of Good point? Um, so, uh, so in in essence, I still think actually in a, in <laughs> despite twenty something years of working in English, I still think in Arabic sometimes. Um, and in in Arabic, there's no equivalent word to decolonizing. Literally, it is independence. So the the anti-colonial wars are the wars of independence in Arabic. Istiqlal is the word we use. And in that sense, um, independence or emancipation, if you will, is a, isn't a one size fits all uh, description. And I don't think it should be. We cannot repeat the mistakes of prescription from uh, above that then people have to apply. So what does that mean? Um, I don't think it needs to be step, step by step. It needs to be context specific and sensitive. It needs to be at every level. One of the immediate possible things to do today is someone going in, in an assessment mission, as we call it, or explo mission in, in some lingo, where a, an outsider it goes to a community affected by an emergency and looks around and decides what to do and goes back a week later having talked to community leaders, religious leaders, whoever is available to talk to them, and they write a proposal, gets approved in the capital and, and gets implemented. Other than the practical impossibility of actually doing a, a real assessment, some agencies do incredibly good ones, epidemiological, very thorough, and so on. It is an outsider by definition. How about a proposition whereby the same people go, do the same assessment, and then sit down with a cross section of society that's not just people with big beards and, and you know the elderly, it's, uh, and and say, okay, here's what we found. Here's what we think. What do you want? And here are the resources we have. What do you want us to do? And then actually do that not consult them and ignore them, do exactly that. And I've been confronted with, um, with uh, uh, um, questions because we, we work on, in medicine when I propose something like this. 
what if we can't do the thing they ask us for? Uh, well, if we can't, then we can't. And, you know, that's the conversation you have with people. What if they ask us for something outrageous? Like, you know, ask us to do female genital mutilation. And here you see the attitude, the condescending attitude, because people who are hungry, uh, need treatment and, and, and uh, doctors and food and shelter will think of none of that and they will only want to do. But let's say they did. We tell them this is out of our, you know, out of our moral commitment and we aren't going to do something like that. Sorry about that. That's not our job and re we reject it. It doesn't mean, you know, giving people agency doesn't mean accepting their moral framework entirely. But then there are other steps. One more step is to stop assuming that diversity and equity and inclusion, you know, consultancies and, and positions are going to resolve the problems of power distribution in humanitarian law or anywhere else. Because those are going to go and find the person of color who is most aligned and least um, privileged and put them in the most positive position or obvious position so we can check the box and go on doing exactly what we're doing. I think I'm not articulating it well, but Sarah Ahmed wrote a book on being included on university diversity, equity, and inclusion and the failure. If that was, a, you know, people like that spend their time trying to market the thing they are doing why does it need marketing if you are hired to do it it should be already marketed within the organization i mean a critical view on every level needs to be done there's plenty of other ideas that we can we can talk about but I'll, i see there's a hand raised so i will stop talking yes please um denise would you like to introduce the person or Yes, Get the um, person on stage. Yeah, uh, the first person was brave enough to start the conversation. First of all, thank you, Tim and Andrea, for the powerful insights and ideas so far. And um, Camilla has raised uh, their hand, and we will now bring them to the panel with us. Camilla, you're still muted, uh, so we can't hear you. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, thank you all so much uh, for this great format. I really enjoyed it and it's um, so much to learn. Um, maybe I just, uh, the topic hasn't been talked about so much yet, but I think to me, it's, uh, it occurred to me as an interesting question. Um, with the last climate conference, I thought uh, if there's any potential in um, the decolonization of aid with uh, the upcoming of the climate crisis, if there is maybe a shift of power to the countries that are affected the most by climate change. And um, for coincidence, they're also the countries that has been colonized in most cases. And um, with the fund uh, of uh, the industri industrial countries giving money to uh, repair what happened. And I just wanted to ask if you see any um, opportunity or chance in this upcoming uh, crisis. And if, if such thing as, as climate conference have any chance to um, take a tiny little step in the direction of decolonization um, because we have to fight this all together and, and stuff like that. I hope I made a point with <laughs> my question. Thank you so much. Thank you, Camilla. Um, tamam. I mean, I have a lot of thoughts on that, but... Um, Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll... Maybe I just uh, voice one introductory thought on that because um, it happens to be also uh, my field of uh, research at the moment. And I've been kind of uh, um, rolling those ideas around in my head as well um, a little so far. And I had the feeling that um, um, especially this framework of loss and damage might be an easier um, inroad into discussions of, of liability and um, um, I'm not even saying reparations but let's let's start with liabilities then um, uh, um, and a connection to a colonial past because I think people are able to understand that um, if I drive a car or 
if my family or my city or my country has um, this X amount of cars and that kind of distributes, uh, contributes to um, emissions in the atmosphere that then can um, um, raises the uh, um, danger for other people to be affected by disasters such as um, sea level rise and flooding and storms. I think this is something easier to accept for people than um, saying, but look, uh, you're a part of a nation state system that is actually built on the exploitation of other people's lives, resources, and so on and so forth. So I think in theory, it might be a good inroad, but um, there's still, I think, some parts of, of the narrative, but also on the practice are missing to, to, to elevate it towards a practice that um, make everyone aware that it's in everyone's best interest to um, behave yourself in certain ways. Come on, please. Thank you, thank you, Andrea. Um, I mean, this is this is very interesting, and I have a couple of thoughts about it. Um, first. I mentioned, you know, depolis I find it problematic that aid is depoliticized or seemingly depoliticized. And it's it, it's a problem, as I mentioned, because it ends up legitimizing governments over people. But it's also a problem because it ends up taking humanitarian assistance or the work of responding to emergencies and conflicts out of a wider field of action that 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 is taking place somehow so uh, in in a world where the forms of activism today take shapes like for example the the uh, extinction rebellion and the climate activism like the anti-racist uh, and, and social justice movement we still see ourselves removed from that because we are doing action not activism and i think this is a problematic proposition because it it prevents the possibility of of intersecting with others of seeing our work from other angles and um, uh, even when we are acting directly on the on the humanitarian consequences of climate change like hunger like displacement like the conflicts that are happening now and will happen much more in the future we aren't able to talk about them in other language or to connect the work we are doing with that of, of others so um, th there's a, a sort of a dissection of of um, uh, uh, of of a potential fragments of anti-capitalist move. Let's call it. Uh, if we believe that you know social injustice, racial injustice, climate collapse, and conflicts and wars and and, and crises are all some of the um, crises of capitalism itself, so. Accepting the depoliticization is a problematic issue. The counterface to it is, uh, this is explicitly a political movement. It just now happens to serve the dominant politics of the world. Because we take permissions to go and do humanitarian aid because we wait for uh, resolutions, we wait for donors and so on. The alternative is an explicitly um, political and considered humanitarian aid. And, and that doesn't have one shape, it has many. One of them is a green humanitarianism that doesn't only concern itself with the, you know, we've been talking about climate change for years now, and the only conclusion we came up with is we should reduce our carbon footprint. We're literally seeing people in en masse suffering the consequences. And it's only now that we're saying, oh, maybe just not, just not taking too many flights isn't the solution that humanitarians can offer. So th that is that is one thing. However, I my precaution is that every um, every active movement that took that line has been dismantled aggressively and violently. Uh, and and one of them is the the uh, uh, WTO protests in the late nineties, the anti capitalist movement, uh, and and they created you know the whole meetings became in places like Saudi Arabia or stuff where protests to start with. Uh, there's no wonder that 
COP28 was in Egypt. Uh, but on the verges of that, in the COP27 in Scotland, there, was, there were days where people were brought from places most affected. The health was most affected and the humanitarian situation by the climate crisis, and they spoke for themselves. They weren't handpicked to say what the organizations hosting them wanted them to say in, in fundraising effort. Or They were speaking clearly articulately they were talking about the the what they want not what we want them to want and that was a start it was the first time i've seen anything like that and i struggle to find stuff like it again but this is a collective effort that needs to happen um stopping co-opting people's voices and bringing that kind the last thing reparations i don't think will happen because if you do reparations then you take all wealth in the world and you return it to its sources that's reparations otherwise we're just doing some compensation so to be honest there's no possible logic of reparations that keeps the world in its current shape so there is a a, a justice a compensation potential that even that is being resisted but i have no enough information or knowledge to be able to give an opinion. Thank you. I see we have another question. And after that, I want to talk about rights and justice a little bit more, maybe. Maybe someone else is also interested in that kind of um, discussion and prepares him or herself for joining us on stream. But um, yeah, Denise. Yes, uh, we have a very interesting question in the chat. It was posted in Indonesian, so I hope the software did the question right. Um, someone is asking or making a comment about global guidelines, rules and um, ethic guidelines and aid, which there are, of course, plenty. And they ask whether and how there is a way to include community and local visions in global guidelines and ethics. Is there a discussion about this? Should there not be one? Is there a possibility to do so? Yes, thank you. Taman, please go ahead. Oh, I love this topic. Um, uh, okay. Um, I'm not seeing people's faces, so I'm not, I don't know how, how uh, um, boring I am. Um, the, the, the point about ethics is we cannot take ethics on face value now anymore. And, and what do I mean by that? I mean, even the most rigorous implementation of the current ethics is one that is based on um, a, a very narrow epistemic view. I, I, I want to take you back to an argument that was made by, by um, uh, de Sousa Santos, a Portuguese philosopher, and uh, uh, Ramon Grasfogo, uh, who's Argentinian, I believe. And it's, it's about the the nature of knowledge that we have now as universal knowledge. And what they said is the only reason what we think is universal is universal is because there has been what they call the epistemocides of, of the past centuries. We have managed, or you know, the West, colonial West has managed to kill every other sort of knowledge. They summarize it in the uh, Americas and killing of the native knowledge of America, the slavery, slave trade, and the killing of the native knowledge of uh, Africa, the uh, um, uh, expulsion of, of Arabs and Jews from Spain and killing the uh, Andalus knowledge and the Inquisition and calling the, uh, killing the feminine knowledge. And what did we remain with? Uh, uh, we remained with uh, the knowledge that is produced exclusively by uh, old white men from five countries, Germany, uh, uh, Italy, France, UK and the US. Hence, we still 300 years later are discussing whether, you know, uh, what it categorical imperative of Kant that, you know, tells you, you should tell the killer at the door that your, you know, friend is inside. So they, because not lying is more important than saving your friend's lives. And that remains the source of knowledge and reason and ethics. So all that is being said, we are dealing now largely in medicine and in humanitarianism with individual ethics with ethics of um with with positive ethics that are individual what i mean by positive is the provision of something costly so unlike the negative ethics don't kill people don't torture people positive ethics are imply cost so you give them aid and then you get the choice of who to give aid to in an ethical way 
it still is individual, it still is extrinsic. So the alternative here in my mind, and this is all called ethics of justice, and there's a whole other stream that has emerged largely from the feminist movement in the, in the second part of the 20th century called the ethics of care. And it's very important to not consider it like this, this is the female ethics as opposed to the justice being the male ethic. It's not. It's just the feminist movement were better thinkers than most of the non-feminist movements. And there is a point about the, the imperative is not only what's important. The purpose is important. The ability to come up with a just situation is important. The caring for other people ca carries a, a, a value in itself. So this is one, one idea that could be put on the table when we talk about ethics. Another is, is uh, ethics that do not come from Western Europe, including the Ubuntu ethic uh, that, that is focused on societies rather than individuals. And that gives agency to the society as a whole. Uh, th there are ethics that come from different angles in, in Arabic traditions, in Chinese Confucian traditions that have been... Um, put on the side under the domination of a very Western individual ethic. So that is being explored and being discussed. And I think there's plenty of things to be done. The problem with this, as is the problem with human rights, which is also a very individualistic thing, as opposed to a communal thing, is that people who are very rightly the, more, the staunchest defenders of those, of ethical humanitarianism, of human rights approaches, are put between a rock and a hard stone. You can't question them because you question them a little and your opponents eliminate this, you know, want to dismantle them, but you also can't defend them blindly because there are other views in the world. So this is a, a, a difficult position to be in. And it takes a much bigger and much more collective action for rights and ethics to be found in a way that is not purely universalist, but also not completely relativist. Yeah. Maybe to um, um, keep uh, that thought a little bit and then um, come to the next, uh, I think, couple of questions that we have. Um, um, I sometimes wonder if humanitarianism and humanitarian actors do not actually use the full resource that actually international law provides to protect people in an in individual but also in collective in, in collective ways for example and um, we talked about climate change and, and loss and damage and then um, you have written in international law this no harm principle that actually really like very clearly states that no nation state has the right to um by 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 exploiting and extracting their own resources to uh, um, do damage to other nation states so there it is this is a, this, this is something that um also a discourse in humanitarianism could build upon also a discourse surrounding loss and damage and and um uh responsibilities um in in this climate crisis that we are facing um the question on ethics and ethos also um um you actually kind of circled the question of humanitarian you, you, you it was implicit but not explicit um because uh, humanitarianism has this kind of um, code of conduct and those those principles and i um I have the feeling that you kind of implicitly um, um, reference them by saying, okay, this is this um, Western world idea of um, uh, the way that humanitarianism should be or that our, our positionality in the in, in this sector should be. Um, if that's not the right thing, um, how, what is the kind of way, the process to come to a more collective and common understanding and maybe re-evaluation re or like putting those principles that we have at the moment aside and uh, collectively uh, decide on on other other um, ethics and principles. Um, just to not, not be uh, too too uh, uh, journalistic from my side, I don't think that the humanitarian principles as they are perceived are entirely wrong or that they should be dismantled altogether. And I think 
in reality, those were written in 1964, I think, by the, the Red Cross, and then adapted. Only four of them, four of the seven, were adapted in uh, 1991 in the General Assembly. And those are humanity, impartiality, independence, and, and uh, uh, neutrality. Uh, effectively, neutrality is as good as dead because uh, uh, it doesn't make sense. And there has been a wide acknowledgement of the problem, but there is, even, even if you want to keep it in, there has been an effort to call, you know, principles that are operational principles. Neutrality is important only as far as it gives you access. It doesn't have a virtue in itself. But something like impartiality, in my opinion, is still a fundamental part of the humanitarian system and, and, and the humanitarian uh, ethos in the sense of we address people not according to anything except their uh, need for being helped. Uh, that, I don't think that should go away. I don't think humanity should go away, although we should, you know, switch it a bit towards the humanity of the people who are receiving the aid, not the humanity, the humanity and humanitarianism of the people who are delivering it. And if anyone wants a, you know, a bit of historical reading on the explanation in 1979, Jean Piquet of the ICRC wrote the um, commentary on the humanitarian principles. And it's a very good place because it's progressive for his time, but fairly traditional if you look at it from now and you see um, how they were explained and explored. So I think a humanitarian principles and an effort like the humanitarian charter that is on in, in the sphere handbook are not bad. They are part of the progress of their time and place. But we can't take them as scripture. The humanitarian principles are not the Bible and, and they shouldn't be seen as such. They should be subject to critical review and understanding. Their explanations should be uh, expanded. We've changed the charter of MSF a couple of times in history, and uh, we are going to change it again when we face uh, uh, issues. But, you know, uh, gender and sexual orientation wasn't on the mind of people when they wrote the charter in 1971, but it is now, and it should be uh, uh, reflected in our charter when we talk about the, the variations that do not affect people's right to aid. So um, there is a progression, there's an evolution. The problem I have with the humanitarian sector now is it's so managerialized that when you have a need to evolution that's inevitable, you create a committee that has a steering committee and a guiding committee and an executive committee and a whole bunch of it. And, you know, you know I don't know if, if the joke applies in German that the donkey is a horse designed by committee. It's uh, it, it just me ends up taking the lowest common denominator, and and those aren't, you know, not even evolutionary, let alone revolutionary changes. So there is a balance to be done, I think, um, that accepts the history, accepts the shortcomings of it, but also the the, the you know temporal and geographical context, but doesn't make them you know sacred dispose of them respectfully and move towards the future. Or disrespect, so it depends on your position and the one. Thank you, Tamam. Um, I think there are um, three questions now. Maybe we can invite all those people on the stage. I would really like that, Denise. Um. Yes, uh, two questions I have right now. They are both uh, posted in the chat. Um, do you want both of them right now or should I give you just one for now? Give us both. Okay, then you can decide where you want to start. Um, there's one comment and question in the chat by Uta who's complimenting Tamam's way to carve out the uh, unresolvable contradiction and tension that constitutes the structure of the field. Um, and her question in this respect is whether giving or providing agency to people isn't another one of these contradictions, which does not deny the step toward it may open up, but thinking about participatory action approach, they wonder whether it is a way out of or rather deeper into those tensions. And then the second question um, by Boris, he's asking about the argument that during an assessment, it is su suggested to find out what is locally asked for in terms of aid. And the question is, what steps can be taken to come closer to a starting point for understanding what should be done locally? And how can outsider and community move, move toward a common moral ground? Do any ideas exist to tackle this?
Um, okay, so uh, I'll, I'll go towards the question of Uta and giving or providing agency to people isn't another contradiction. Of course it is. Uh, it's um, <laughs> the problem with that with this is, is multi-layered. One is that we give agency to people. People, you don't give agency, you deprive people of agency. So we should stop depriving them of agency in the name of giving them aid. The other thing is people aren't a homogenous body. We um, we 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 end up talking about community and countries and so on in a way that is so homogenizing that we do not uh, we do not see ourselves in. So, uh, you know, if you talk to someone who is a, a you know, who likes beer or you know local food in Germany, and you make a mistake about regional beers, you're quite in trouble because there is a distinction. Regions are different, peoples are different, towns, villages, and so on. That's a function of familiarity and of identification. Yet we talk about, uh, you know, there are all the jokes about Africa is not a country. We still talk about generally about sub-Saharan Africa as if there is any homogeneity to it. So um, we don't give agency and we don't give identity. We just remove the barriers or the historical and current oppressive means of depriving people of, uh, of, of identity and, 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 uh, uh, and agency. And those aren't always like mean looking, evil looking efforts. When you want reports in English, you are forcing people to do something that's unnatural to them. When you want Excel files or sheets, when you want KPIs, when you want stuff that didn't exist hell, outside, you know, didn't exist in Europe until a couple of decades. Now we cannot give people a penny to have food or medicine without them producing a proposal that has KPIs and a log frame and so on. Talk about agency, and it should fit our taste for that. So when we talk about dissolving power, it's not about giving people the ability to, you know, use the same oppressive machine on themselves. It is the ability to choose how to do things. I know I'm being ambiguous. Let me try to explain it. Uh, uh, Chul Han, which is a Swiss Korean philosopher, talked about the next step after biopolitics of Foucault's biopolitics. Foucault talks about how governing people's bodies is the politics of time. You don't need to torture them. You don't, as was the case, you need to put them in a context where they have to act in a certain way to survive. Chulhan talks about psychopolitics, which is stuff like our phones and our uh, self-expectation, self-development and, you know, achievement at work. You don't even need someone to biopolitically dominate you, you do it yourself for the likes, for the appreciation, for the promotion. For the, uh, That's what we do to people in aid as well. We don't have to oppress them. We just give them the tool to oppress themselves in the name of receiving aid and being modern and being capable of mingling in the international circles. So there is a compli complexity to it. It's not just eliminating the NGO in the middle and giving the donor money to the local NGO. Mm -hmm. I hope I made sense. I feel I lost my train of thought a couple of times, but <laughs> sorry. You created new nuts of thought. I, I think that are also very much inspiring. And this is maybe in itself also a way um, to think about new things and, and create new common understandings, I think. Um, I would like to use the opportunity to actually really invite people to the stage. So um, it kind of um, um, takes this direction that people are, are, are writing lengthy passages in the chat, uh, which is not really the idea of a fishbowl. So please people be, um, be uh, in solidarity with us and join us on stage and um, discuss uh, with, our, with us here. Um, Please come to us and maybe um, um, until you do, um, there has been this question that uh, Denise has already mentioned, uh, again, talking about localization and how to assess people's needs and um, safeguard uh, uh, misuse within that um, 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 process, which kind of makes me think of um, something I would like to discuss or is a stepping 
stone too. Something I would like to discuss to you uh, with you is um, this idea of actually mutual aid systems that are maybe um, the solution and the dissolvement of the humanitarian system in and of itself. Because um, we have been discussed doing this in private um, a little bit already. This idea that I think um, communal action is so important to actually help people um, um, create communities that then are able to um, to fix their own problems, um, leaving aside the big the, the the big overarching contradiction of a capitalist system that uh, always uh, um, um, favors those uh, who are in power and not the marginalized people, but um, that those communal systems might be um, the solution to something that the humanitarian sector has been. Um, Desperately uh, um, trying to find solutions for. Um, so, is mutual aid um, the hmm. next evolutionary step after a humanitarian aid system? Tamam. What are you? Um, thinking? So, um, to talk, I just want to comment on Boris's question because he says, uh, "What." Uh, there might be an issue if the community asks for immoral activities like FGM. And there is an issue because FGM is a horrible practice. However, just a couple of caveats. Um, there, I, I can't articulate it well, first because I am a man and I feel completely out of place talking about this. But I'm quoting researchers who worked on it. First, it's not as straight as men do it to women. It is a deeply ingrained uh, practice that is part of a very strict social hierarchy. We have act upon it as uh, in a way that different than it is. But that's beside the point. It is a horrible practice. No, no one should participate in it. But how do we look at it? We have had during the pandemic, uh, uh, plenty of communities in Western countries that have rejected uh, vaccination, for example. And by doing so, man, with a, you know, believe, however people believe, the point is not there. The point is that uh, there was a potential of if you're wrong about the vaccine, you're actually causing harm to others. Yet the imagery of that wasn't created in a way that puts people in, in, the, in, in sort of immoral or there are people practicing their right of choice. They aren't immoral, they aren't bad, they aren't evil. So I just want to bring the attention to the fact that what is immoral and how is it depicted is, is very also culturally relative. Uh, and, and from both sides. Um, but the, to, to, to talk about the, the, the uh, question, you, you put it in, in, in quotation marks, Boris, but you say taken to come closer to a starting point for outsiders and local community in terms of understanding what should be done locally. That optimally, the outsider has no say. If you, you know, in, in an ideal world, you have, you know, a, a, let's, I, I think of things like, um, individually as a, as a physician or as a person that I have a neighbor whose house has flooded. I, do I have a right to go and sit with them and force them to reach consent with me about which tools I would like to lend them so they can get their house out of the water? That would be absurd, wouldn't it? If you said, okay, I'm not going to lend you anything from my garage until we sit and agree mutually, or I tell you what you need. That's absurd. It's equally absurd when it comes to a community. What is logical is that I open my garage and I invite him in and then whatever he decides to do, I carry the tools and help him as he decided to do. Because the implicit is I have an obligation as a neighbor to do that, as a human to do that, but also the reciprocal implication that when my house floods, mm. She's coming to help me. That's the idea of mutual aid, mm -hmm. is the debt that a society has towards each other. Mm -hmm. It's what we owe each other as people, not only out of the goodness of our hearts, but out of the survival of society as a society. And here's the other problem. 
that we can do that internationally. Although if you read Peter Singer on aiding other, he says there's no value in aiding your neighbor over aiding someone in a different place, uh, morally at least. Mm -hmm. But if it, we don't do that because we don't think of ourselves as a global community, we call it that, but we don't. Right. And if we believe that, we would have acted differently. Mm -hmm. If we believe that, the, the West wouldn't have bought all the vaccines of COVID multiple times over and let people die in, in the rest, health workers mm -hmm. and elderly people die. We don't believe that we are a community. And dare I say, we don't believe that people are equally human. We'd like to aid them. I'll go back to, to Ashil Mbembe, who's a fascinating philosopher, and, and, and in his book, In the Post-Colony, uh, on the post-colony, he, a few pages were very hard to swallow. We talk about dehumanizing practices. When we say dehumanizing, we mean we are turn people into entities that are closer to animals. And then someone will say, oh, but we're aiding them. Yes. And Bembe says, you can have affection to animals, but you don't consider them equal. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying this is what's happening, by saying it's very hard to swallow an international community that talks about equal rights, about equal obligations, yet remains a, a hostage to hyper-nationalism, to national borders that are produced by colonialism, doesn't challenge them ever, and accepts all the, the death and mayhem that results from. And we, despite all the sun frontierism of the whole humanitarian world, still function within that the system and are very skilled at navigating it. So mm -hmm. the question is, are we helping or harming? And who are we helping or harming in the process? Yeah, thank you for um, this nice image with the garage and opening up new, new, new um, um, windows. Uh, um, for thought and for um, um, engaging um, others to join us. Um, I believe there are already two people who would like to be um, with us in the fish bowl to contribute. Uh, yes, and the first of them will be uh, Leon, who will join us on the panel right now. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Hello. Um, so thank you so much for the opportunity. I really, um, I really want to continue what Tamam just said, but I will talk in Bahasa, and I will try to be uh, slowly uh, to in speaking. Uh, saya, saya ingin meneruskan apa yang tadi Tamam baru saja. Uh, okay. Menjelaskan. I would like to add something to what was said before. Uh, second here. Now. Lian seems to be muted. Okay. So, um, uh, berkaitan dengan bagaimana masyarakat the interpreter can't hear. Now the, the, the audio is back. I would like to talk about the fact that within a community, the community should have power itself. Even though there are social conflicts like in our country, also when it comes to, or as a consequence of natural disasters, Aid, humanitarian aid, is being given. The amount of aid that we received, especially after the tsunami catastrophe, well, we received so much humanitarian aid, so many organizations paid us a visit. We were given so much support and aid. I would like to ask the following question. When we get that kind of aid, then from an Indonesian perspective, the position of those being given the aid in contrast to the position of those giving the aid, then I see contradictions often. There is no real balance as if there was some sort of pressure, some sort of standard that needs to be followed. The society on the ground and the cooperation with the organization, the institutions giving the help. 
something else that we experience in the region where I come from is that receiving aid did not only impact the regional culture, it created dependencies. And as you rightly explained, this means that those giving aid, organizations giving aid, did not look at us as a society and they did not realize the realities on the ground. There are some aspects that we paid attention to, namely that this was developed into some sort of business, humanitarian aid as a business. That means local cultures were not acknowledged whatsoever. And they did not pay attention to what was needed for the society to develop itself on its own, to tackle the problems on its own and to solve them on its own. And we need to think about what we can do to decolonize that kind of system. You once something happened, you need to learn together what to do. You need to learn. You need to learn to see what kind of action is needed and what is already existing on the ground so that those who want to give aid first need to study what's what's there, what's on the ground, what does exist already, where are the local strengths, and what is possible in order to strengthen the already existing local structures. Indonesia and also in the region where I come from, this was the case. There is a buzzword that is very important in our society, and that is mutual help. And it needs to be mutual. You need to lend mutual support, not just one side helping the other side. And there is a term in Indonesia, Godongoyo, which means mutual support within a society. So that means help is always given mutually. And in this respect or in this context, it means that you do not see the other as a victim of a natural disaster, a victim of a situation, but you see the other as someone who is able to do something on their own without being suppressed. So that means you need to be in a situation where you can help each other, where you can also assess a situation and where you can understand a given situation. For instance, there is an earthquake, which ha happens quite often in Indonesia. In such a case, many international organizations come to our country, many different institutions and organizations to give us help. So this leads to a situation where people just open their hands to receive aid you need to create some sort of communal kitchen where people can go to together to create something together so that people can think about what they can harvest from their own garden and what can they do with it. So the position of those receiving aid needs to be strengthened. If you want to make a contribution, and if you want to help people in need of help, then you need to make participation a, a possibility. 
Thank you so much, Diane, for um, uh, putting your question and, and your, your comment and kind of um, uh, enriching our discussion. Before um, Tamam answers, I would actually like to um, also get Emma on stage to get um, her position as well. And we can all remain on stage. Um, just as a heads up, we have 10 minutes more. So um, let's um, yeah be good with the time. Emma, please. Join us. Uh, yes, hello. Thank you for this opportunity. And um, my, my question uh, doesn't really have anything to do with the previous question. And I think the previous question is way more important. And uh, my question would be like in a practical way um, of like, sorry, I'm a bit sick. So um, what I noticed when I did like an internship in an NGO is the huge language barrier that exists between the local population, the local workers, and then um, like the people who come from the West to lead the organization, they usually only speak English. If it's good English, you know, you need to see that. And now in the context of decolonizing aid is like how, like what is a practical way to deal with language? You don't wanna do that. If you still get money from countries in the global North. Thank you. Thank you. Tamam. You have five minutes. <laughs> okay, I'll be as fast as I can, but Leanne has said something extremely significant. And Leanne, thank you for that. I had the privilege of working alongside Indonesian colleagues after the tsunami in Aceh. And it, it was an incredibly illuminating and tough experience in the sense of um, I'll, I'll just give you a couple of examples. One of the things that we, I, I was in, 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 in a, a settlement of people who were displaced by the tsunami, that's nearly a year, less than a year after the tsunami, inside a school, an old school building. And it was so underserviced, despite it being you know, supplied by humanitarian agencies, that they didn't put toilets in. So people were using what was... Uh, called the flying toilets, which is doing their business in plastic bags and throwing them across the wall where there was a mountain by the time of plastic bags with pestering feces. And, and we asked, well, why on earth are, are they you know, putting toilets? And the answer was because we don't want them to settle. We want them to go back to their um, original land. And didn't make sense why, why wouldn't people want to, to the extent that they were living under those conditions. It took a lot of asking and answering to, to understand something that was absolutely obvious to people in, in the community. The tsunami changed the geography of the land. I come from a village in the south of Syria, my father, where the, the, the delineation of land is more important than life knowing exactly what's your land, what's other person's lands. They couldn't do that because the land changed shape. And they weren't going about to go back because they would start having real problems in society if they cannot tell which whose land is who is where. So we decided to punish them collectively. I'm not saying we as an organization. I, the, the, the humanitarian sector decided to coerce them by preventing them from having dignified sanitation facilities. So to force them to go back to a land that they cannot uh, uh, distribute. This is, you know, this is bluntly coercive measures. This is not very different from what colonial authorities did actually in time. So, you know, Leanne, I, I mean, I wish we'd stop doing shit like that before we talk about, you know, real participation. And this is where I go. In reality, um, we're incapable of understanding people's desire. They also, act in the way they, they, people are extremely smart. Communities are smart. It doesn't take too many humanitarian organizations to pass by before they know exactly what to tell, you know, people to get the, the aid they need. Um, and they do, and that's brilliant. But this is not participation. This is, this is paternalism and condescension. And, and the whole mentality of we know better needs to go away. Entirely, and this is where my, I, at least my position is, we, we do what people tell us to do within our limitations of expertise. And I'm not saying we should drop expertise. We still need to do medicine that doesn't kill people. We still need to give shelter that doesn't harm people and so on and so on. But it doesn't need to be something enforced on them. And to go back to Emma's question uh, on language, 
I'll, I'll, I'm not at time give you an, an example. Because many of the aid agencies are French originating, if you are an aid worker today and you want to go on mission, which is still called mission, uh, as if we're Jesuits or soldiers, uh, we, we, if you're going to West Africa, you need to know French. You absolutely need to know French. There's no alternative. They are not going to send someone who doesn't. But if you go to the Middle East, you don't need to know Arabic. You can know Khalasa, inshallah, and that's fine. And that isn't like people are not even conscious of it. When the pandemic started, I went and suggested I take a sabbatical and join an active organization that works in my country, in Syria, with people who know Khalas and Inshallah, and work in help with the, with the planning and work in, in the community in, in Switzerland, where I live, in Geneva. And I was told, no, no, your, your, your French is not good enough. Uh, you can't really work in a community without knowing the language. And the person who told me that is someone who has worked in my country without knowing Arabic. The massively ingrained differentiation between people is incredible. And we need to be conscientious of that. And that person wasn't bad. She wasn't a bad person. She was, she was a brilliant person, a very good friend. The idea is we're all conditioned, all of us, of all backgrounds and colors as well, conditioned to accept the biases of the system as true. So the participation, it requires a really deep and, and, and incredibly painful look at how do we act in all those like minor ways that enforces the biases. People, when we look at traditional healing practices as uh, backward and, 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 you know, stupid or what, there's plenty of stuff that we can look at. And I don't want to, stretch my time too much, but I think I made a point. Thank you, Tamam. Um, I would now like to take the opportunity for a brief wrap up. Um, you can gather your thoughts, Tamam, to uh, think about uh, your final statement or the, this one or two messages that you like to uh, convey to people in the end. And um, I would also like to make use of my privilege as the moderator and add one more point to the discussion that you had just had in the in the fishbowl discussion. Um, um, connected to this very uh, well put um, thought of um, humanitarians need to learn the context and need to be aware of what context they uh, are operating in and uh, that also includes definitely language um, but I como antropologa as an anthropologist would also like to add that this is not Uh, that is just one side of the medal. The other side of the medal is that humanitarians need to be uh, a lot better in being aware of their own system and systematic shortcomings. And this is kind of um, necessary to understand also um, the reactions received by, for example, people that don't want to participate in vaccination campaigns, people in Haiti who don't want to go to cholera treatment centers because of the role of the international community in, 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 in uh, bringing harm to communities. So um, I would like to uh, broaden this, this perspective on not only um, using an anthropological lens to look at the other, but also an anthropological lens to look at our own systems and kind of try to um, um, create a common understanding with, uh, with the communities humanitarians are uh, serving um, on, 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 on the shared system and um, citing um, maybe my last point, citing one of those Latin American thinkers, Santiago Castro Gomez, um, wrote a piece on, um, he called La uh, Ubres de Puento Zero, the hybrids of the zero point, because I think uh, humanitarianism and humanitarian actors have been very well in um, um, thinking of themselves as a blank paper, you know, that, and, 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 and um, their own backgrounds, their own histories have none of whatsoever to do with the way they are received in 2012, 2022 uh, 20, or whatever in certain contexts. So I think this is a very um, um, important part for reflection for humanitarians, It's their own their own structures historically and, uh, and present in, in, in those um, entanglements. Um, 
Before I give the last word to you, Tamam, uh, I would like to thank everyone for um, their uh, thoughts and um, uh, inspirations and ideas and comments. I would like to thank um, the organizers uh, for inviting us um, uh, to speak and giving um, Tamam uh, the, the platform to speak. And I would like to point out to the next session um, that is going to take place on the 26th of February uh, and it's called Smashing Windows Rethinking Aid Beyond the North-South Axis. I think it will be also, it will be a good continuation of uh, parts and pieces that we have already discussed and um, I hope to see you then and uh, discuss further. Tamam, please go ahead with your final message. Thank you. I, I will uh, I, I will be very short. I think I, I I think we need to reconsider our view of ourselves as what are we and and what are we doing? And if we are obviously we are trying to save people's lives who are under um, uh, duress of emergencies. If that's the singular cause that moves you, then find people in the next neighborhood or in the next village or in the next um, region. If you're going and occupying the very scarce place of a transnational uh, aid system, that, then you need to think of another layer. And this is very political. You could be um, what Bardiot described as the left hand of the state. You could be enforcing the survival of a dominant system by accepting it wholesale. Or you could be undermining it by exploring your own as a system and the bigger pictures, uh, vulnerabilities and inconsistencies and contradictions. And the last thing I will say is, I know that this is not the most cheerful conversation. And many people ask if, should we still do that or not? And my answer if is if the people who are affected by this, stop doing it, then we leave it for people who don't care. And the other one is all of us are in vulnerable positions, regardless where we are, regardless of the background and everything. So uh, uh, since we're not in Hollywood, we don't really need uh, prophets or, or martyrs. We need collective action. And that is a bigger picture. Um, and, and that's what people should find each other for. And, and act together and, and, and enact that mutual aid and, and collaboration that, that uh, Andrea mentioned. And thank you very much again for having me. It's a privilege. Thank you. Thank you to everyone and um, see you next time. Thanks. <laughs>